It's time for the The Douglas Douglas Coleman Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators, the famous and not so famous, the controversial and the light and fluffy, we have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome back to the Douglas Coleman show for his fourth appearance. (laughs) <laughs> Stu Shostak. Hey, Stu, how are you? Welcome back. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm good you realize that I've moved in. You may not know this, but I'm actually <laughs> occupying space in your garage, Douglas. So <laughs> You're going to be like Joan Rivers. You remember how many times she was on The Tonight Show? Yeah, but don't forget, she ended up hosting the show, so you better be careful. Oh, that's true. Although there was that whole feud between her and Johnny, right? And then she didn't, Jay got it instead of her. She well, she guest hosted. I I will tell you a little secret that doesn't that a lot of people don't know is that leading up to that Fox deal that she took without apparently talking to Johnny there the two things. Number one, apparently she did try to talk to Carson a couple of months uh, before she took the deal because it was brewing and she felt the loyalty. That's not discussed that much. And the other thing was that there was there she was getting vibes from the producers and NBC that they were going to terminate her anyway. Uh, So the writing was on the wall. And that's what led her to start serious discussions with Fox about doing a late night show for them. There's nothing confirmed, but she was getting vibes that they were tired of her shtick and tired of her. And they were looking for Gary Shandling or David Brenner or somebody else to be the permanent guest host when Carson was not there. So that has never been discussed in great detail, but she started to get the feeling that she was being eased out of there. And that was another reason why she went and did what she did. So well, was she ever in the running to be the permanent replacement for Johnny when he retired? You know, I, she might have been in the very beginning when they were very high on her. Yeah. But the ratings started to level off with her because she was doing the same thing week after week. You know, you know, when she, my daughter, Melissa, she's 14. She was 14 for six years, you know, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. Just re- re- repeating herself over and over again. And people were getting tired of the shtick and the ratings were dropping a little bit and and uh, they wanted to freshen up the show and get somebody else in there. And so there were definitely talks held about replacing her, and she got wind of it. So, you know, she, she, she wasn't the victim in this. You know, she claimed she was. Um, you know, uh, she, she had inklings that th- things were happening there. And, and listen, you're in show business. You know it's not a, a you know, a cut-and-dry thing. A lot of I, – I can't tell you how many times – Network people would come to me after I do an audience warm up, uh, particularly NBC, now that I'm thinking about it, because the network people were there obviously to watch the show and make sure it was being done to their standards. And very frequently, some of these network people would sit in the audience. And so they'd have to listen to me and my shtick every week. And when I worked on shows that were on the fence, the network executives would always say, you know, we don't know if we're picking the show up next year. It's 50-50, but we want it. This is what they always said. We want to keep you in the NBC family. So, you know, keep in touch with us. And I always got their cards because network executives change from year to year. And when the shows I worked on got canceled and I'd call the office, not once, Douglas, not once did I ever get past the secretary. I would just leave messages. Wow. So it, it's all a crock of BS. What they tell you, you can't believe anything they tell you. So I fully believe what I heard, that Joan Rivers was getting vibes that they were going to drop her as the permanent guest host. Well, um, it's very you know, possible. Yeah. Well, yeah, and she wasn't making that money, she, uh, that much money. She was getting scale. But the point is, you take something like that for the visibility and to, and God knows she did this, by a Doc Severance, and that was one of the other things that was really grating on me, was she'd take that gig so she'd have a national audience to promote her nightclub appearances. And she never did it. 
They'd sit there. Remember, if you remember, when she hosted that show, she'd do her monologue. Oh, oh, grow up. Oh, my daughter, Melissa, she's 14. Oh, blah, blah, blah. She, oh, Elizabeth Taylor, fat. You know, she'd do the same stuff over and over again. <laughs> uh, you're, you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay? and, and that's what was getting tiresome. But what really irritated me is they'd go to commercial, they'd come back, and they'd sit at the desk, and Doc would make two seconds of patter with hey, a good monologue Joan that was wonderful terrific great by the way I heard that you're going to be in Woodbury Connecticut on June 14th and then you're going to Florida on July 7th and then you're going to go to Boston on August you know and this was the same thing day after day week after week it's like all right shut up enough with the plugs you remember this right Doc would sit there and tell yeah. her where she would be appearing so she wouldn't have to do it and it got so monotonous I quit watching it and I think NBC you know got wind of this you know from the fan mail or non-fan mail just the the comments they were getting and I firmly believe that they were thinking of you know when her contract was up was letting her go so anyway that's not why you called today but you see when you get me off on a tangent that's what happens well that's all right and in fact I want to add one more thing and then we'll switch over to what we were going to okay. talk about do you okay. do you know who Charlie Barrett is Oh, the name sounds familiar, but I do not, I cannot place him. So here, here's a quite here, here's something you'll have to tell me. Okay. Well, speaking of the Tonight Show, um, he was a guest on my show a year ago, maybe. Um, he was the head of media relations at the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson for 15 years, from the late '80s to the probably late 90s or maybe maybe earlier 80s he said it was the fred silverman years well so, that would have been 79 on oh, silverman okay. started there in 79 and silverman was gone when grant tinker came back in 82 i think silverman was only there a couple of years oh all right but so, anyway go ahead so then he would have been there from like maybe 79 to 84 or something somewhere like that but he um you know, he was in charge of the media specifically for Johnny. And since Johnny gave very few interviews, he said there wasn't a lot for him to do. <laughs> right, and he right. just talked about it. But it was funny because uh, th this guy have met two of the people, two of my idols. And it was interesting because he did that. Before he was on NBC, he worked at Capitol Records. And he's the only person I've ever interviewed who met all four Beatles in the same room, you know? And I thought that oh, was my. I thought that was really impressive because I've had other musicians on who maybe have met Paul or Ringo, you know, after they broke up. But he met all four Beatles at Abbey Road Studios when they were having a party for, I think it was the Abbey Road album or maybe the White Album. I forget which album. But he was okay. there. Yeah. And George Martin. And I mean, he met all of them at the same time. And I thought, wow. You know, oh, that is really cool. That was impressive. That really cool. Yeah. Did did he have anything to say about Joan Rivers? Well, see, uh, I didn't ask him, but I will now. Yeah. Uh, next time I speak with him and if I can get him back on the show. Yeah, um, but if you said he was the, he was with the Tonight Show for fifteen years, then it would have been it would have been the last fifteen years that Johnny was there because Johnny left in ninety two. Did he did he stay on when Jay Leno took it over, or did he leave when Carson left? No, I think he left when Carson left. Yeah. Okay, so if he was there fifteen years, he started in seventy seven. Then he would have started right before Fred Silverman uh, came in. Okay, and and, and th mm. those were interesting years too. I I. Uh, I've had guests on my show who have talked about working uh, on shows during Fred Silverman's regime at NBC, and that was what what I refer to as Silverman's desperation period. You know, he was he was the wonderkin and at uh, CBS in the early '70s. He worked under Bob Wood and changed the face of television by you know helping to bring Norman Lear in there and the Mary Tyler Moore Bob Newhart Empire. And then he was coaxed away to ABC to do the same thing for them. I think we talked about this on the last show. And what happened there was he went totally in the opposite direction. He put all of these 
sitcoms on that dumbed down the dumbed down uh, yeah we did talk about genre, that. Yeah. right yeah. and then nbc was floundering by that point and they coaxed him into going to nbc and he did nothing right at nbc i mean that was the biggest the biggest blunder and 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 he he burned bridges with producers over there and i think that only lasted a a couple of years he couldn't he couldn't recapture what he did at the other two networks a third time so what did he do? He ended up leaving the network, forming his own production company, and taking all of these old half-hour sitcom stars like uh, Andy Griffith and Carol O'Connor and Dick Van Dyke and giving them one-hour dramatic series and, and making them bona fide hits all over again. So he found a new forte in becoming a, an independent producer and, and putting you know these icons from, from the days of television when we were growing up into different formats I mean, because think about this. Who would have thought that Carol O'Connor as Archie Bunker could go on and do another five or six years on a show called In the Heat of the Night, which was, you know, based on the movie and, and Dick Van Dyke doing a, 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 mis, a mystery drama series like Murder, She Wrote and lasting, you know, four more years than the Dick Van Dyke show lasted, you know, and Andy Griffith as a as a as a country bumpkin lawyer. Who would have thought that any of this would have happened? And and so so you have to hand it to Silverman. He was able to reinvent himself uh, as a non-network programmer and as an independent producer, and also give work again to all of these guys who had successful uh, sitcoms originally. I mean, think of how many times both Andy Griffith and Dick Van Dyke uh, tried to come back in in sitcoms after their initial successes, and they all didn't work. None of them worked. The new Dick Van Dyke show got three years, and it was a good show. It just people kept comparing it to the original. But Dick had a, had a variety show and, a, and a, another sitcom after that that was on and off in a few weeks, and Andy Griffith, you want to talk bomb? Do you remember Headmaster? No. Oh, my God. Oh, look that up. <laughs> I will. Look up Google, Google Headmaster when we're done here. What a disaster. So, anyway, we're off We're off track again, Douglas. You see what you do to me every time I you have me on here? <laughs> All right. Well, there's no way to, to segue into this, so I'll just go. Paul Peterson. <laughs> what a cue. Yeah, a isn't cue. that great? Um, now, I have listened to several of the interviews you have how many you have of him about six seven on your site oh, he was a he he did the show once a year uh starting the second or third year of the show um uh and then when i went to television on the internet he did i think two shows um he's probably been on eight or nine times closer okay. to eight or nine times because i'm i'm in my 17th year on my show right now so he had to have done it at least half of those at wow. least half okay so I've always liked Paul Peterson. I always liked uh, his organization. I didn't know that much about his history. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about. I know he was a Mouseketeer. And then, for about five minutes, <clears throat> yes. For about five minutes. And then he was on the Donna Reed show. And after that, I don't know what he did. And then all of a sudden he pops up again with his a minor consideration, and I started seeing that come up a lot because he was involved with all of these child actors who had been, uh, God knows, everything. Um, right. And, but what, did something happen to him specifically that kind of motivated him to do this? Or was it just the other ones that were like his friends and he saw them getting into drugs or getting into trouble? I mean, what was his story? It, it, the combination of both. Uh, after the Donna Reed show came out, if you recall, uh, he had a, a, a pop bubblegum singing career as a r result of the Donna Reed show. My dad was, you know, a big hit, and he was assigned to uh, Coal Gems Records, which was a division of Screen Gems. It was their record division. Oh, okay. And um, he became a teen idol. Uh, he would have become a teen idol without the music because as he was growing into manhood, uh, the teenage girls were really discovering him and, you know, uh, uh, you know, and he was a nice looking guy and a clean cut guy and on a clean cut show. So he's every teenage girl's dream. And when the when the music career started and that was because of Donna Reed's husband, Tony Owen, uh, it was another way for them to branch out, get publicity for the show and also make more money. Uh, his uh, her husband got him the original record deal and uh got him the my dad and all that and then and then uh, uh Stu Phillips who did the music 
on the Donna Reed show was was somewhat in charge, I think, of Cold Gems Records. And they brainstormed and, and basically, you know, there were songs written for him and he recorded several albums. And so the long answer to your short question is once the Donna Reed show went off the air, he had three or four at maximum years of moderate success as a singer. But you mentioned them a couple of minutes ago. There was a thing called the Beatles that sort of <laughs> yeah. wiped out the careers of Paul Peterson and Frankie Avalon and Fabian and, you know, name your early 60s singing star, Bobby Vinton, Bobby Rydell. Um, some of them were able to continue. They became more, more, more mainstream, easy listening type performers that adapted and did cover songs and sort of went the Andy Williams, Tony Bennett route. The Letterman survived that. Uh, they're still performing to this day, although the original members, except for Tony, I think, are all been replaced. Um, so, so some of them were able to continue, but they had to change. They, 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 they couldn't change with the way rock music changed, so they went the other direction. They went the Frank Sinatra way, and they were able to carve out a living, a, a decent living. They didn't make the money that they made. Paul was not able to do that for whatever reason, whether he didn't want to start you know, singing the songs that Ray Conniff did or whatever, I don't know. Um, and, and when his career slid in the late 60s, you know, he hosted a, a game show, too, for ABC. Uh, I forgot the name. Oh, Dream Girl. Dream Girl of 67. You can look that up, too. That was short-lived, but he was trying all kinds of different things to stay relevant. He, he got some guest roles. He made some guest appearances. I know he did a Mannix. I think he was on Bonanza, so he made the rounds a little bit, but the problem was that old typecasting thing came around, um, you know, where he was perceived by producers as being too too clear, too clean cut and too bubblegumish to adapt to shows like The Mod Squad and, you know, to a certain extent, you know, once Norman Lear came in, you know, he wasn't going to fit in with that type of comedy. And so, yes, he he did get into drugs and alcohol uh, pretty pretty severely for a while there. Uh, and for several years, he went through his Coogan money, you know, being on a series, a portion of the money that he made for those eight years had to be put in a bank account. And he got that, I think, when he was 21, and he, he rifled through that pretty quickly. And uh, pretty much, unfortunately and sadly, because he's a, one of the nicest people I know, uh, you know, kind of went into oblivion. Um, and at some point, and then he wrote his autobiography, and it's called Walt, Walt, Mickey, and Me. I think is the title of it. It's something similar to that. But in that, but that was came out in the mid '70s, about '75, when he realized that he better straighten himself up. Uh, or he was not going to be long for this planet. And, and he was able to lick the drugs and the alcohol pretty well, pretty well, but he didn't give up the cigarettes. And he started smoking. I, it was either at age 12 or at age 14. It was right, right around the time he got the, the Donna Reed show. And he was a chain smoker. And he, that's one habit he couldn't break. And his weight was up and down and up and down and up and down. He, he, he was able to, you know, like I said, get rid of the drugs and the alcohol for the most part. He lapsed a couple of times, but he was able to pull himself out. But the smoking continued. And that's why he's in poor health today. He's got COPD. He finally went public with it. I had to keep quiet about it. His last few appearances on my show uh, were, were a little rough for him. We had to take commercial breaks more often so that he could rest his voice. Um, and on one of them, he still was going out in the backyard and smoking while the commercials were on. These were in the days when I was doing live shows. If you take a look at the last show that he did with me, which was either 2018 or 2019, he's very thin and frail on camera the whole time. We got through the show fine, and he sounded fine, but he had uh, the um, oxygen breath thing. At first, he was taking... Uh, just the, the, the hits off the oxygen thing. It was a portable thing that he just carried around with him. But it soon turned into the thing where he had to have the tubes up his nose and carry the big t uh, uh, tanks with him. And I, I haven't seen or talked to him in about two years. But the last time I saw him, 
he was sitting in a chair, but there was a wheelchair next to him. So he was telling me that it was it was hard for him to walk more than five minutes at a time without having to sit down and rest. And that's what, you know, all those years of cigarette smoke do to you. They they clog your arteries and clog your lungs and, they, you know, you don't have the energy and, and it starts to take away from your voice. So he's not able to, you know, I, I live up in the mountains now. He, he can't come up here because of the altitude. The air is too thin and because he can't talk for more than a few minutes at a time. So he's right now what he's doing is mostly writing. He's on, he's got a very high... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, he's on Facebook. He's, I can't think of the word. I'm old. Um, presence. <laughs> Thank you. I can't think of a word like presence, Douglas. Um, he's got a very high presence on Facebook. He posts all the time there. Uh, he's still very smart and very wise. And, and uh, you know, he's still got a huge following. Um, but that's, that's, that's what happened. Now, do you, wanna, do you want me to tell you how he got involved with how he started a minor consideration? Yes. Okay, so what happened was he had straightened himself out, and somewhere in the early 80s, he, he started a limousine business. He grew a handlebar mustache. Uh, he still looked like, you know, Jeff Stone with a handlebar mustache, but, you know, <laughs> he was trying to, trying to branch out and, and break away from the stereotypic image that he had. He'd pretty much given up acting at that point and was doing other things and he started this limo business and because of his connections in the business a lot of his clients ended up being you know people that he had worked with on either movies or on the Donna Reed show or you know did a guest appearance with and uh, he became a regular driver when they when these people who were still working were going out of town to, to do appearances or movies or whatever he'd drive them back into the airport back from into the airport and um, so he did that for many years and then, around 1992, Rusty Hamer, who played Rusty on the Danny Thomas show, committed suicide at 42 years old or 45 years old, whatever it was. And Paul was dumbfounded by this because in the early days of TV, all, all of the sitcom kids knew each other. They would, you know, have parades down Hollywood Boulevard or appearances at Disneyland, whatever, and they would invite all the kids from all the different sitcoms to appear, you know, for the public. And so he, he knew Rusty. I don't know how well he knew him, but he knew him. And he knew Rusty, like him, had a, had a very hard time transitioning from being a kid actor to an adult. It's pretty much Danny Thomas's fault, unknowingly. We can talk about that on another show if you want. Um, but Rusty, like so many of these kids, had had trouble transitioning and uh, ended up moving to Louisiana and living in a mobile home park or something. I don't know. Had had no money. He was another one of these kids whose parents, you know, frittered away the money that they were allowed to have during the time he was working. And then when he turned 21, he spent all his money in a year or whatever, however much there was. Um and uh, committed suicide, and that struck Paul very strongly. And in investigating further, he found that, you know, uh, 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 Jay was not the only one that was having problems transitioning. Um, I forgot the kid's name who was, who was on Rin Tin Tin, but uh, Michael Winkleman, who was the kid on Real McCoys, was having some issues. Another child actor named Charles Herbert, who I don't think was ever in a regular series, but if you look him up, was on pretty much every television show in in the 50s and early 60s. Was he, Had, sorry to interrupt you, was he the yeah. one who co-starred with Paul in Houseboat, the little yes. blonde kid? Yes. Oh, how yes. did I know that? One point for me. Mimi Gibson, Mimi Gibson <laughs> was the girl in that. Yeah, very good, Douglas. Mm -hmm. You remembered that. Mimi Gibson was. That's where Mimi met Paul. Mimi is. Is um, I, I don't know when this show of yours is airing, but she's on my show on February eighth. Mimi is going to come, and we're going to talk about all this. Mimi was, got on the board of uh, minor consideration and and went with Paul and a bunch of other child former child stars to Sacramento to get the laws changed. I don't know if you remember that was about 10 or 12 years ago. Um it took them a long time. They had help from Sheila James who was uh, Zelda on Dobie Gillis because she was a uh, uh, a city supervisor. So and and she was a state senator at the time for California. So with her help, I mean they had an in there because she was there. She was a former child actress herself. So um, but in any case, 
Charles Herbert had a torturous life. He was a cute kid on on the air, on television and in movies, but his parents uh, took undue advantage of his fame and wealth and were actually giving him pills to keep him small oh and young looking. So as an adult, I don't think he was taller than 5'2 or 5'3. I don't know. It's very, very, very sad situation. And and the more the more investigating that Paul did, the more he was appalled by this. And and he felt it was his duty because he had gone through the same thing to make the public today aware of this. And at first he was poo-pooed. It's like, yeah, you're, you know, you're a washed-up, has-been, bubblegum rock star, you know, child actor. But he got enough current actors involved in his cause. There were plenty of people uh, as adults that knew them as kids. That got, and 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 within a, a very short amount of time, within four or five years, became a force to be reckoned with. So much so, a minor consideration became such a strong force that if Paul got wind of kids being abused or mistreated on a set, he had permission to enter any studio in Hollywood and go in there and get on the set and raise hell with the producers. And he did. And he did it to the point where if they saw Paul Peterson coming toward them, they ran away. So I, I think as an adult... You know, a lot of producers. A lot of producers agreed with him and and didn't know, you know, because the producers are in, are in their offices when stuff is being shot, so they don't know what's always happening on the set with the directors and the people around them. Uh, he was able to make them more aware. A lot of producers did did agree with him. He, he and once Sacramento got involved and it became the law, they had to. So he took this. I don't want to call it idea. Let's call it a concept of helping former child stars cope. He not only he not only protected them on the set, but he took them into their homes, like Dana Plato from Different Strokes. She was homeless a lot. He would actually take them into his house and c counsel them and 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 uh, uh, you, you know help 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 them to 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 because he went through the same thing. Uh, and I don't think he took a psychology or a psychiatric uh, course in his life. I think everything that he did, he based on his own knowledge and and his own um, uh, experience. And and uh, you know, uh, there's nobody like him. Nobody went to the trouble of that. And the problem now that he's having is because he's in bad health. He's trying to keep this going. He's appointed some former child actors that he's hoping to pass the baton to. I don't want to mention any names because they're all, they were all like gung ho in the beginning. It's like, yeah, we'll do this. But you see, we talked about this before. Like when you're trying to replace Carol O'Connor on all in the family that you, you have some people in mind like Jackie Gleason or whatever. You cannot replace Paul Peterson for what he's done with a minor consideration. And so there have been people that have come in there and say, yes, I will do it with the fury and the force that you have done. But and, and they come in that way, but after a month and they see how hard it is and how much time they have to devote, they kind of peter out and go away. And it's very discouraging to Paul because I don't think he's found the one person yet that's going to be able to keep this going after he departs. And he's not in great health right now, and I know that's a major concern of his. Um, and like I said, people come in and they're gung ho about it and he's happy and he tells them, you know, how to counsel people and, 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 and what to look for on sets when there's issues. But I, I you know, I, I just hope that there'll be somebody or some group of people that will be able to keep that, that whole, uh, enterprise going once he's gone. There will never be another Paul Peterson. I have never seen anybody so devoted and so sincere and so honest and so serious about, this whole this whole thing well i think so, it's it's a very necessary thing to have because while you were talking uh, a whole bunch of names just popped into my head and they were all tragic you know just suicide or drugs and the names that came up were trent layman <clears throat> yes from nanny and the professor from nanny and uh -huh. the professor who committed suicide i think at 18 or 19 yes uh jonathan brandis Yes. Um, Brad Renfro. These these are these are later uh, uh, 
uh, child actors, right? Because some, so I've heard these names, but I can't pinpoint. Uh, you know, I, 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 I Dana Plato, uh, uh, Gary, Gary Coleman had major problems. Uh, he he died from health reasons. He didn't commit suicide, but his parents squandered his money. Um, who else was I thinking of? Oh, uh, Anissa Jones from uh, Family. Oh, from Affair. Family. She Affair, OD'd yeah. at eighteen. Right. Um, th- th- go ahead. You had some other ones. Um, and uh, River Phoenix was the other one that came to mind. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there have been many. There have been many, and a lot of times it's the parents' fault, um, you know, for, for, for over overprotection and overbearing when they're kids. And uh, like I said, I've got Mimi Gibson uh, coming on my show, and, and she had an overbearing mother that spent all of her money. And Scotty Morrow is doing my show. Uh, he may have already done it by the time this, this uh, show of yours airs. And, and Scotty had, had no money, and, and, and neither Mimi nor Scotty were ever in a series. And so the Coogan Law did not apply to them. The Coogan Law says that when you have a regular role in a television series, you have to set aside a certain amount of money from, from each week so that when the child becomes of age, they have money to survive in case their career doesn't go on. But when you're a working actor, and both Mimi and Scotty worked like crazy in the 50s and the early 60s, but they never got a series. Uh, all of the money that they made was dispersed to the parents, and the parents went out and bought houses and cars and put in swimming pools, all that, you know, thanks to the income of the kids. Now, in Scott's case, uh, his mother, uh, he had an older brother who was in the business. His mother worked very hard teaching them their lines when they were too young to, to read and was on the set and made sure she was a lot like Paul and made sure that, you know, the kids were treated fairly and they got breaks and they were given food and water. And she, uh, Scott's mother, when there were other kids on the set, kind of took charge and became the head stage mother and made sure that all of the kids uh, were treated. The other mothers, the other people on the set loved Scott's mother because she was, you know, gung-ho. It's like, no, 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 they've got to have a break. They've got to go to school. You can't do this. Blah, blah. So she and the social worker would work really hard. But in the case of Mimi's mother... Yeah, she was on the set, but um, she kept telling Mimi, you know, the money you make is keeping us alive. So they moved around a lot and uh, spent a lot of money, and, 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 and Mimi basically had nothing. And the problem with a lot of these kids, with most of them, is when they become of age, you know, in Rusty Hamer's case, he played a wise cracking kid his whole life on the Danny Thomas show from the time he was six until he was 16 or 17. And you watch those early Danny Thomas shows and he's cute as hell when he delivers those lines. He's funny and with the wise cracks and great, terrific little actor. But the last couple of years of that show where he's almost an adult, it's painful to watch him try to do those wise guy lines they come off as rude and it's like you want to choke the kid <laughs> and the problem well you watch those last couple of years they had to kind of tone down his wisecracks because they weren't funny anymore they were offensive because he was an adult practically and that's why he had trouble getting work for 13 years he played this wisecracking kid and by the time he was an adult, he had lost a lot of that charm he had as a kid. He couldn't act anymore. Or let's just say he couldn't act as well. And his career took a skid. He ended up being a delivery boy and flipping hamburgers and doing all these menial jobs that you'd never think you know, somebody who was a major star as a kid would end up doing. And he didn't get the right counseling. And he didn't get, you know, I, I, I know his father died at a very young age. And so he didn't have a father. Danny Thomas pretty much acted as his father all those years. But, you know, once the show ends, that family is over. You, you hear the old showbiz story. Yeah, we'll keep in touch, you know, and stay friends. And, and once in a while that happens. I have a few friends from the days I did audience warm-ups that I still talk to on a regular basis. But most of them I don't. Uh, and when they do surface, it's great to see them again. And, and it, it, we should, you know, it's the old, yeah, we should stay in touch more often, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then two days later when they go, that's the end of it. And that's what happens with a lot of these kids is they're just ignored. And yeah. Paul, God love him, you know, took this whole thing and, and said, look, you're still loved. If nobody else cares about you, I do because I've been through this and I will do my best to help you. And he, he spent the last... 35 years of his life convincing this country that kids, kids, whether they're in show business or not, should not be ignored if they're having problems. And, and, um, but yeah, the list of suicides that you see there from show business, that's just one example. Think of all of the teens 
because of bullying on the internet and all of this other stuff. And my daughter went through this and we had a rough period with her. Think of all of the teenage kids who have committed suicide that aren't in the business that are going through the same thing. I mean, this is off, off topic here, but this is a major, major problem. And social media has made it far worse. Well, I agree with far you. Worse. Yeah. Far worse. We're at, this is a much more complicated and difficult world than it was when Paul and all of these other kid actors, you know, Jay, Jay North was, Paul's second conquest. Jay North, after after Rusty Hamer died, Paul went after Jay. And Jay's been on my show, and Jay had a torturous life. I mean, I loved him as Dennis the Menace. He was a good little actor. He was great. I lo- He was one of my idols. But the hell he endured. His mother worked for AFTRA. He also lost his father at a young age. And so he was given custody uh, to his aunt and uncle. And, and his uncle was a horrible, horrible person who forced Jay into doing stuff he didn't want to do, every personal appearance, every way, every scheme that he could use that poor little kid to make a buck, he did. He abused him and treated him horribly and punished him. If he made a mistake on while they were filming, you know, then they'd have to cut. Jay was so apologetic to everybody. He went out of his way, I'm sorry I messed up, blah, 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 because he knew when he got home that his father would whip the crap, or his uncle, rather, would whip the crap out of him. He got beaten. And he was a nice, sweet kid professionally, never raised his voice, never questioned, he did what he was told, because he knew if he was out of line on the set, he'd go home and get the belt to him from his uncle. It was horrible. And and Paul worked with him. Jay, Jay was still bitter, even when I had him on my show. Jay and I have become friends, although he lives in Florida, and I don't see him much anymore. Um, but when he does come to town, we do see each other. And I, I'm very proud of myself because um, – Jay doesn't like talking about the Dennis the Menace years because of what went on behind the scenes. But I had Jeannie Russell on with him and Gloria Henry. I did a whole Dennis the Menace reunion. I had the three of them, the three remaining cast members from Dennis the Menace. And I let Jay vent for the first part of the show. And then we started talking about Dennis the Menace. And with Jeannie and Gloria's help, we were able, I I was able to bring up specific, because there were shows that Jeannie did with Jay where she had a really good time. And she said, Jay's not going to, Jay's not going to give you anything on it. He's just going to talk torture and all this stuff. And I said, well, wait a minute. I have a way here. So, so Jeannie and I talked about an episode they did where they pretended to be married. And Jeannie said, Jay, do you remember what happened behind the scenes there with this National Geographic magazine, blah, 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 blah. And it, you can you can listen to my show and hear all this, but it, it, a light bulb went off in Jay's head at that moment. He had a big smile on his face, and I'm very proud of myself. For the rest of that show, I got him to talk about the great times he had on the set at Dennis the Menace. Got his mind totally off his aunt and uncle, and he it was a catharsis for him. When we got done with the show, he said, "I I hadn't thought about that stuff in 35 years." I forgot some of the good times we had because of the torture behind the scenes. But at least now I can remember. Yes, there were some fun times, and 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 Paul worked with him, and he worked with Lisa Loring and the Adams family, and all of these other kids. That he basically saved them. He saved them. They're still messed up to a certain degree, but they're able to survive, and they're able to, you know, to to socialize and to. To, to to work to be in in society he's done so much so much incredible and and he taught me a little bit I'm no expert but when I had a lot of these former child actors on my show I got them to smile and remember good stuff too and there are a lot of actors that had good childhoods like Jerry Mathers and Tony Dow two very well adjusted great they had they, they both had great parents um, they both didn't force them. Uh, and, 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 you know, we lost Tony last year. He was the best man at my wedding. The most well-adjusted. He was Wally Cleaver. I mean, you could go to him with any problem, and as a big brother, he would help you. So there are a lot of success stories. But, uh, you know, I think the tragedies do outweigh um, the success only because they're more prevalent in the industry than, than the successful ones are. Uh, I, I hope I've answered your question because I've been rambling again for the last six years. <laughs> That's all right. It's, it's just my tendency, as you know. Um, well, okay. the one thing that wasn't talked about back in the 50s and the 60s and was the sexual abuse aspect of Hollywood, which we've heard a lot about 
recently, yep. since basically from Michael Jackson on, um, yeah. and all of these different child sex rings and Hollywood pedophiles, all this kind of stuff. And yep. I can't help but believe that some of these kids that had real problems later in life may have been abused, and they just buried it because it wasn't Absolutely. something that was talked about. Absolutely. Listen, it went on when I was doing audience warm-ups in the 80s. There were agents and managers that had nothing but young boy clients, single men that weren't married and didn't have families. You do the math. Now, I'm not trying to generalize here and say all of them, but I saw it. And without naming names, uh, when I worked on Silver Spoons, I a couple of the kid actors would come up to me because, you know, I was sort of a big brother to them at that point and ask questions. And I, I would say to them, did so-and-so really do that? Yeah, I said, you need to tell your parents now. Tell them now. I didn't want to get involved in it, but they, they trusted me. So it, it was definitely, de you've heard of the casting couch for women in the 30s and 40s. Pretty sure. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, and if you go to the L.A. Times uh, and Google, uh, do either Google LA Times, and, and there, there have been in in the last five or six years, there have been stories about pedophile managers coming forward that you know writing these articles from prison. There, you probably heard the show, uh, the Jerry Sandusky show that I did with Paul. We we did a whole expose on on this, what you're talking about, and uh, Paul said it ran rampant in the 50s and 60s, and it was hidden because there was no social media back then. There was no internet. The closest you got to it was Photo Play Magazine. I think, were they, were they the gossip ones before yeah. National Enquirer? Yeah. Uh, there, there were always gossip magazines. That's how Desi Arnaz got nailed at a, at a uh, house of ill repute. Uh, that, that actually made the Herald Examiner, and that was the start of the end of the marriage of Lucy and Desi because it, you know, she'd known it had gone on for years, but it became public. Uh, but that's a whole nother thing with, with the pedophile managers and agents. Uh, it, it was very prominent back then. And, uh, uh, I guess we can leave it at that. We don't want to name any names, but LA times has had several articles. Once the Jerry Sandusky thing broke, uh, um, Hollywood, Hollywood, uh, uh, became prominent too, and all of a sudden there were articles about these uh, past past people. A lot of them are deceased now, but some of them that were still alive are in prison. And and as I discussed with Paul, prison does not reform that. That is not that's not like robbing a bank and getting your wrist slapped and say don't do that. When you have that problem, that is a psychological. That is a disease. That is something that cannot be cured. That's an urge that prison is not going to cure. In fact, you know, you've heard these horror stories about, you know, these sex-starved prisoners doing it with each other. That's true. So that's not going to reform them. That's that's an illness, that's a sickness that cannot be that cannot be corrected by prison time. Um and I said to Paul, "What do we do? What do you do?" He said, "Well, you you got to put them in mental institutions, uh, you know, and 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 try to counsel them." Again, it's 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 beyond their control. It's 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 like a heterosexual relationship. It's like a homosexual relationship. It's just it's just the way somebody is. It, I don't think it it can be fixed. I mean, you can surgically fix them if you catch my drift to keep them from doing it, but the urge is still going to be there and and it's an illness. It's do you see what I'm saying? It's yeah. it's not it's not akin to, to doing something, it's against the law, but it's not akin to, I, I'll say it again, for like robbing a bank. You know, you might be able to reform somebody and teach them right from wrong, but you can't, you can't keep somebody from having urges. It's sick and it's sad, but the only way you can do is to keep them out of society. Well, you has he, <clears throat> has Paul ever had to uh, intervene in something like that or go to the police and... To, oh sure. For the welfare oh, sure. of a child that was suspected well, or had been abused, sure, but yeah. you, you know, the the uh, the culprit, we'll call him, can, you know, afford the best lawyers in town and they're going to do what they can to prove that Paul is lying, you know? I mean, look how long any kind of court case. Look at the McMartin preschool. 
That thing went on for years, that case of them molesting their kids. Uh, it, went on, it went on for decades. You can't get immediate justice anymore. No. And, and in the interim, they're going to keep doing it. They're just going to keep doing it. And I saw it. I saw it firsthand when I was working on sitcoms that had kids in the 80s. It's disgusting and it's sick. And the only thing you can do is remove them from society. They, they, they cannot function in a society when they have these urges that are wrong. But again, they can't control the way they feel. You know, like I said, you can deal with it physically. You can neuter them. But it, it's not going to it's not going to stop them from having those feelings. So what do you do? Jail's not going to help. They have to be institutionalized. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm no, I'm not Dr. Phil. Dr. <laughs> Phil isn't even Dr. Phil. What a no, quack. Dr. Phil well, isn't not, Dr. Phil not even get in there. Let's, let me, let me get, let me make it a little more credible. I'm not Dr. Joyce brothers, although people can question her too. You know, any, any, any psychologist or psychiatrist who doesn't feel that his private practice is successful enough and has to go on TV. It's like lawyers that advertise on TV. Something's wrong if you've got to go on TV to get your clients. Yeah, you that's, know? that's pretty that's bad. A, it's pretty that, That's a whole other thing that we don't need to go into. But, I, I, you know, Douglas, I don't know what... I don't know what the solution to this is. It's it's probably still going on in Hollywood. I haven't done audience warm-ups in over 20 years. I'm sort of out of the loop. I do my own thing. I left L.A. because I hated it. Uh, you know, I do my show twice a month. And, uh, you know, we, we the only time I ever got into a discussion like this outside of what I'm having with you is when Paul was on the show. And we did a whole a whole thing on this. And, and uh, I'm only telling you what, what we think needs to be done you can't have people like that in society when they have these urges they they have to be you no. know i think paul made a joke about uh, like you know gather them all up and just dump them on an island and let them be together there because prison's not going to help them and just keep them isolated so they can't swim back ashore or whatever you can't kill them you know that's, that's well that's why they work. built alcatraz i mean that was the idea <laughs> with alcatraz. but alcatraz is a prison and and, yeah. and they're not going to get the counseling if even if the counseling would help them they're going to be treated as if they were thieves and robbers or murderers yeah. you know uh they're not going to they're not going to get the help that they need to 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 suppress those urges if they can be suppressed that's um, i don't think so but that's a psychological what? conversation for no, another show no, there are, you know there are people that there are men that are attracted to women and women that are attracted to men there are women that are attracted to women there are men that are attracted to men and that's fine that's consenting adults but when 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 men are attracted to little boys that's a problem that's yeah. a big problem and that's something that society cannot tolerate you that 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 cannot be a part of this um and the poor kids have no idea that they're being victimized. And, and that does, to sum this all up, contribute to their unhappiness as an adult because they become an adult and they're confused and they're not working and they're not getting the attention they got as a kid. And they were lied to by these people saying, I'm, I'm grooming you because this is what's going to happen when you're an adult. Exactly. And so that yeah. leads to it too. So, Well, here's a, it, here's a softer right. transition. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, on this topic, and then we'll wind it up. Uh, I okay. listened to one of your interviews with Johnny Whitaker, and he told a story. I mean, he told it sort of humorously, but it, it wasn't very funny when you think about it. When he was on Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, that he said he was invited to some actor's dressing room to go over their lines, or that was the ploy. And when he got to the dressing room, he said the guy was standing there in his underwear. And then Johnny realized that he didn't have any lines with this guy. And I guess he sort of got out of there. I don't think anything happened. At least he didn't say. Well, there's a perfect example of yeah. a naive kid um, who's just trying to be friendly. You know, when these kids, when the fame hits them, you know, they can go one of two ways. They can become demanding and egotistical and spoiled, and that's part of the parents' fault. Or they can be grateful 
um, like I was. Of course, I was an adult when I started doing audience warm-ups. You know, some shows were very good to me. They asked if I wanted makeup, and I wasn't on camera. I was just going in front of 300 people. Some gave me dressing rooms and some different. Some didn't. I never questioned. I never said, I want this, I want that, I want that. I was always grateful for the work. And, and I will say that most of the uh, kid actors that I worked with back then were that way. There were a few that were spoiled, and the parents, when there was lunch... Uh, all of the kids on the show would eat together except the star of the show. The parents would not let the star of the show eat with the kids. That's not a good idea to, you know, intermingle with supporting actors, God forbid. So it is the parents' fault. In Johnny's case, i only known Johnny as, a, as an adult, and I don't know him all that well. But what I do know is he's a down-to-earth, regular, sweet guy who came from a very large Mormon family who needed his acting uh, money and and work to survive you know i don't know it's like the osmonds what is it with these mormons they have to have you know eight or ten kids each i mean fine that's great but johnny ended up supporting them he had no problem with it he had a great relationship with his parents uh he knew that the money he was making was going toward uh, their survival he worked a lot as a kid he was on family affair you know for years so he did get a big chunk of money uh, from from uh, the Coogan Law, but as an adult, as he got older and not as cute and cuddly, the roles got less and less, and he too went down the wrong path for a while. Not as long as Paul's path, but long enough that he was messed up for a while. He gained a lot of weight, um, but he too straightened himself out, and like Paul, is helping not just kids in the business, but any kid who needs problem? Johnny, I do believe, went to college and got a degree, got a degree in psychology, and counsels kids uh, in mental health. And I oh, think good. that's what yeah. that's what he's doing now. He he lives in the Valencia area, and um, every time that I've seen him, his encounters were nothing short of pleasant. He even g- visited my wife in the hospital when she was recovering from her brain aneurysm. Um, and to me, again, I'm not I'm not that close to him, but I see him, and and you know we yeah you know, uh, I think he's pretty well adjusted. Uh, again, I, I I don't know him as well as I know Paul and some of the and Jay and some of the other people, but anytime I've seen him, he's been he's been wonderful. He's been a great guy, very friendly, open, wanting to know what's going on in my life, and tells me. Uh, last time I talked to him, he was considering starting doing a podcast, and he asked for my expertise. And I, it was a text, and I texted him back and said, hey, great to hear from you. Uh, here's basically what you need, but call me, let's talk, and I'll help you get set up. And that was the end of that. That was about a year ago. Um, as far as I know, he's he's doing fine. Have you heard uh, his album? His his album? His He had a record album? Yeah, way back. Um, it was I, called I don't have it. Friends. <laughs> I found a picture, and because I was doing a little bit of research for him prior to you coming on the show uh-huh. and a picture of him when well, he looked like about Sigmund and the sea monster. So maybe he was 13, 14 years old. Okay. Yeah. Early seventies, early seventies. Okay. And it, it was called Johnny Whitaker friends. And I just laughed because I thought, Oh my God, what is this? What could this possibly sound like? You know? And, and did you listen to it? Well, no, it's just a picture of the album cover. Oh, Oh, Oh no. I, I you know, that was the other thing. Just like I told you, Donna Reed's husband and Tony Owen got both Paul and Shelley Fabre. Who oh, so that's. Stand it. You know, Johnny yeah. Angel, you know, she, he, uh, Tony wanted Shelley to go the same route as Paul, and she flat, re, flatly refused. She couldn't stand it. She did it because she was under contract, but as soon as she had the ability to get out of it, she quit. That was, she did not want to do that. She just did not like it. She was uncomfortable. You know, they, they did that with so many of them. Um, the one that. That was the point. Did you know Jerry Mathers had a forty-five out? Stan Lipston <laughs> had a forty-five. Oh they, my God! Beverly Washburn, all of these people that you would never think yeah. were sick. But that was the thing back then, Douglas. They figured it was another avenue for them to make money and to to become a success. And in addition to the television role, there, my friend Bob Lesjack, who I just had on the show, is an expert on on a lot of things television, but he's more of an expert. On, on radio and music, and he's got a book out called From the Small Screen to Vinyl. And the book is all about people, like we just mentioned, 
having these, I don't even think they're one-hit wonders. They're one wonders. Jay North had an album oh in 59 God. called Jay North Sings. It was all, he's got it all documented in this book. It's a wonderful book, and it's got everything in it. And if you go to YouTube and Google some of this stuff, you can hear you can hear some of this stuff. Oh, I gotta and check it out. It, most yeah. of it is god awful. I've never said that to the guests <laughs> when we talk about it, but they know it. I let them say it. Like Beverly Washburn said, "I am no singer, and I'm embarrassed by this." And and uh, but we laugh about it. We well, laugh you, about it. So you know who else? From soft green to vinyl. I will. And, and yeah. this was the norm. The other one that comes to mind uh, was Jack Wild. Remember him? Yes, from you know, Oliver, right? He was Oliver, and then he was on Puff and Stuff. Puff and Stuff, yeah, right. yeah. Another. He, he was going to be another Davy Jones, and it didn't. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. But he put out three albums, and they yeah. all flopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, you know these these geniuses at the studios get these ideas. And say, well, the kids a hit on the show. Let's let's branch them out. Let's let's give them a record album. You know that 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 was the norm back then. Today. It wouldn't fly at all. Number one, because well, vinyl's making a comeback. I don't understand that at all. I still don't get why vinyl is uh, making a comeback. But again, anybody with a microphone, you know, and a and a and a, and a web connection can have a show or or become a a song, you know. Or any idiot with a microphone like me can have a talk <laughs> show. So. You know, we talked about this before. You and I right. are, are, are trying to do quality work, and we're competing with 12-year-olds doing makeup tips, you know? It's true. That's, our, comp that's <laughs> our competition because, you know, the problem with our audience is, well, at least mine, I don't know about yours, my, my audience is so computer uh, illiterate that they don't even know how to get to my website to watch my show. So I have a Roku channel, which works like a television, and they don't even know how to install the channel to watch it there. That's That's my problem, you know? Um, but, and that's why I'm competing, and we've talked about this before, you know, with, with uh, TikTok and all this other garbage that's out there. Well, you know what you should do for those people is you should put a compilation VHS tape together and mail it to them. VHS tape. That's right. They still have VCRs that go 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. That's right. Yeah, they'll watch it that way. <laughs> I have to find where they are, though, and I have to contact them by snail mail. Right, exactly. Because they don't do email. Oh, you got to mail it to them. Yeah, not email. <laughs> <laughs> Stu, we have oh. just burned through our hour, and I want to cut it God, off at this point. God, what, what a team we make, Doug. Oh, it's I do great. all the talking, and you do all the listening, and it's your show. There's something wrong here. <laughs> well, listen, I, I enjoy having you on, and believe me, you make my job very easy. Well, thank you. I enjoy being with you because you're a good listener. And that's that's half the battle of being a decent and a good talk show host is being a good listener. So your follow up questions uh, fit right in that that and that most people don't know how to do that. And you know how to do it very well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you know, my heroes in this business and they've always been were Johnny Carson and Dick Cavett. Mm -hmm. and, Cavett's my hero. Yeah. And so um, if I watch them relentlessly and I'm trying to get something right in the middle, maybe not as intellectual as... To totally different styles. Totally different styles. Excellent interviewers. Yeah. And you can throw a little bit of Merv in there if you want. Every once in a while when you hear something fascinating, you can go, ooh, ooh. that's nice. <laughs> <You know. laughs> no, I don't know about Merv. He was a little... Uh, <laughs> Nobody talks about Mike Douglas anymore. You know? Yeah, he, was, he just was, sort of came and went, didn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. And there was nothing wrong with him. He was fine. He he attracted good guests. He was a nice, uh, simple, easygoing uh, uh, interviewer. He was fine. But nobody nobody talks about him anymore. And he was on the air for as long as Merv was, almost. You, you remember Virginia Graham? I remember Virginia Graham. <laughs> what do you have new and exciting in your life today, dear? Oh, God. Whatever happened to her? She died. Well, good, uh, <laughs> good thing. She was old when she did that show, Douglas. Yeah. And, and Dinah Shore was another one in Dinah, those days. Dinah was not a great interviewer, but she was such a sweet lady. She was sweet, and, yeah. And Lucy, Lucy, when I was working for Lucy, she loved Dinah. But Lucy's big thing was, speak up, I can't hear you. <laughs> yes, you, you sing, you're so great, nice and loud. When you talk, you got this little voice. I can't hear a damn thing you're saying. Speak up. She did have a whisper voice like Jackie Kennedy, didn't she? Yeah. 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 Yes, 
She did, but but a lovely, lovely lady. But again, she she didn't have the staying power that Merv or Johnny or uh, Dick Dick Cavett had. Um, uh, Dick, you know, um, when Shelley Berman did my show, when we finished, he put his arm around me and said, "Best interview I've had since Cavett," and that was oh, that's like a compliment. The, yeah. Oh, the ultimate compliment to me. That meant more to me. I I couldn't I couldn't believe it. Jonathan Winter said the same thing. He said, he said, you're just like Carson. You just let me go and go. I was warned um, when when Winters was uh, booked for my show by his people. They said, now, you know, when you ask him a question, he's going to answer it. But he's going to give you five minutes of shtick before he, you, he gets to it. So don't stop him. Let him do his thing. <laughs> don't because I have a tendency to interrupt a lot. Uh, and I let him. I, I paid attention. And when, he, when we got done, he said to me, young man. You may as well have been Johnny Carson. You just let me go and go and go, and I thank you kindly for that. So, you know, I've been blessed. I've had so many great, great stars on my show. Some are still with us, like Bob Barker and Dick Van Dyke, thank God. But Jonathan Winters and Shelley Berman and people like that, where if you told me as a kid that not only would I become friends with them as a result of the show, but to have them to myself for two hours to ask them anything I want, and they both opened up. They, it was amazing. The two things that they told me about Shelley Berman was don't bring up his toupee and don't bring up and don't bring up Bob Newhart because for years he thought Bob Newhart stole his telephone act oh, from him. Okay. okay. And he felt so comfortable he brought up the toupee during the show. And he says, you might be asking why I like wearing this toupee even when, because this was in my audio days, it wasn't television, even when we're just doing, and he did, he did five minutes on his toupee. And I, and, and I just sat there, it's like, he feels comfortable enough that he brought it up. Well, what was interesting, and, speaking of toupee and Johnny Whitaker was when Johnny said that Brian Keith wore a toupee. I would have never guessed. Both he and McMurray wore toupees. Yeah, that's amazing. But they weren't, yeah. they weren't obvious toupees. They weren't like, you, you, you know, name somebody who wears a toupee that's obvious uh, that it's a hairpiece. Oh, well, Shelly, Shelly Berman, okay? It's obviously a hairpiece. McMurray's was very, he had hair in the back. It was thinning. So he had just a little piece that went right above his forehead. And I think the same thing with, with Brian Keith. It was the same deal. And, you, you know, it's a coincidence because both of those shows were produced by Don Federson. And both of those shows, the guy, they, they had the stars. McMurray and Keith had it in their contract. They had to get all the scripts done for the year before they started production. And they shot all of their scenes with the kids and everything in like three weeks. They did all 30 scripts or 26 scripts, whatever, using Brian Keith and Fred McMurray. And then they'd go away, and then they'd come back and do the last 10 at the end of the season. And in the middle, they would shoot around them. They would shoot the scenes around those episodes and shoot scenes that they weren't in or whatever. It was incredible. Can you imagine? This is before videotape, before they could reference. They have to look at the clothes they were wearing in oh, whatever God. scene it was, Fred. Their hair, oh. the like Stan and Barry, they'd have to, their haircuts would have to look exactly the same. Because it may be two, three months after McMurray shot his portions of those shows before they'd go back and shoot the rest of the show around him. I love my thesis. Oh, I like that show, too. Yeah, I watch that one. Family Affair, I don't it's, ever it's remember series. watching. It wasn't just my three sons. It was my three sons, my three grandsons, my, 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 my two uh, daughters-in-law, and, and, and strange old uncle who's still cooking mashed potatoes in the kitchen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and the courtship of Eddie's father was kind of a snoozer. I used to like to put that one on and would fall asleep. Yeah, I, I like the earlier episodes in that. The problem with that, like with every show with kids, is is Brandon Cruz started to get older and they started to, the premise started to wear thin, you know? What would have happened if that show had continued was Bill Bixby probably would have gotten married and um, they would have probably got into more serious stuff with Eddie going to high school and all of that sort of thing. I, I think that show only lasted three seasons. I, I watched it. I wasn't a... A huge fan of it, but I love Bill Bixby because I loved my favorite Martian. And anything Bill Bixby did, I loved. He was one of my my favorite actors. And I did get to meet him before he passed, and he was a great great guy, really nice guy. Oh, well, the so show I, that Bill Bixby did that I loved was The Magician. Ah, okay. My friend Larry Anderson, who played Lucy's 
son-in-law on Life with Lucy was the consultant for that because Larry was a professional magician and he appeared in a couple of those and he loved Bill Bixby and Bill really got into the magic. He really wanted to learn how to do that and 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 he was uh, de- dexterous enough that he could do it. See, I can't. I'm not. I have no dexterity whatsoever. I can't do any of that stuff. But Bill really got into that, and that show only lasted half a season or a season, as I recall. It didn't last very long. Well, I know some backstory about that. I had. Uh, do you know who Michael Grandinetti is? I've heard the name. He's a you know Las Vegas magician, kind of not quite yeah. as famous as um, Copperfield, but you know maybe one click down. From David Copperfield, okay. and he yeah, I, does. Like I said, I knew the name. But yeah, he does like Super Bowl halftime stuff, and he gets around. Anyways, he knew kind of some backstory about that, where he said that Bill absolutely insisted that the magic be done for real, rather than doing it as camera tricks uh, and studio tricks. So he learned all of the tricks that he was going to do in the show. Right. The reason that the show didn't last for too long is that it was just damn expensive to produce. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. And the ratings didn't justify. And the, it ra- uh, cost yeah. Exactly. Involved. But Larry, Larry loved Bill, and like I, yeah. So that jives with what I told you. Bill insisted on learning all that stuff, and and you know when they cut a close ups to hands doing tricks, that's his hands. That's not a magician's hands. No, so, he did it know. all for real. So he kept the yeah. integrity because he had so much respect for the magic community he didn't want to misrepresent it or uh, kind of discredit it disrespect it by doing it you know okay cut all right you know like they did on bewitched i mean obviously that was yeah all, yeah all camera yeah, or, or like on any, any sitcom premise where the guy wins uh a, a part on a show uh and he ends up being the stunt person for the star right so you know <laughs> Got the, you got you got Tony Curtis, let's say, who's going to jump off a cliff, and it's like, okay, here we go, cut. All right, who's the guy that won the contest? Get up there, you, you know, jump off the cliff, you know. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's see. Shall we say goodbye again and see how long that runs this time? Okay, we can start. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to edit because we're over an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you on, and. You know, you can come on as just like a regular guest. I think this is wonderful. And each time, actually, what we I should do. I have, haven't I? <laughs> well, you have, but we should continue this trend. And, okay. And each time you come on, we'll like pick somebody or one show. and <laughs> in, in my case, pick on somebody, yes. And then that'll run for the hour. I, well, I, yeah. I figured out that just one show will well, do. You, told me, you, said, you said you wanted to talk about Paul Peterson and Johnny Whitaker. And we did. So I, I think we accomplished this. Well, except we did 45 minutes on Paul and 15 on Johnny. But <laughs> Well, that's up, for, up to you <laughs> to decide what goes out. <laughs> but that's all right. And there's plenty of other people we can talk about, too. So. Well, yeah, I, I have uh, many stories from my warm-up days and from working for Lucille Ball and, you know, just from people I've had on my show. A lot of a lot of celebrities opened up. I mean, I felt like Barbara Walters on some of these things where <laughs> they just feel so comfortable and they forget that they're on the air and they lean back away from the mic. I mean, that happens all the time. I guess I just, you know, I, I try to make this more of a conversation like you and I have had than, than a, a Q&A, you know, David Susskind type, you know, where were you on the night oh, of I July? Hate, I hate those kind of things. Yeah. You know, I, I'd rather much, much rather have a conversation um, I've been on shows when I was back in my musician days promoting my music where they actually sent me the questions that would be asked before I go on the show. And I thought that was just so bad. Every once in a while, uh, a guest will say, can, can you tell me what we're going to talk about ahead of time so that I can get my thoughts? And, and usually I don't, but in cases where I sense that some people are a bit nervous about talking about themselves, most aren't, um, I'll send them the outline. But I won't, I won't send them the outline with my inside notes on them. I'll just say, this is what we'll discuss type of thing. In other words, I, I work I, in the early days when I was young, 17 years ago, I, I did everything without notes. I, I didn't even have an I, I even the intros. And then at some point, I, I would listen to the shows I've done, and, 
oh, I left this out or I did that, so I thought it'd be a good idea to just have an outline and also write up an introduction. And, and that's the way I've been. And as I'm getting older, I'm not remembering stuff as much, and so I'm glad I've, I've got that there because every once in a while I'll think we've covered everything and I'll look down and I'll say, oh, forgot about this bullet point. <laughs> and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No. I, 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 you know, um, I, I, it doesn't bother me that sometimes my audience will see me look down so that I can find my place and figure out what I'm going to ask. Um, I think if you do it in a way where it doesn't look like you know you're struggling and you're just kind of trying to keep the show going, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. At least you know my audience would tell me if that was the case. And and uh, w one of the things that's happened is just in the last couple of years since I moved up here, the sh show has gotten so popular on the live the live broadcast. Even though the show is recorded now, the days that where they air. Uh, the bandwidth has exceeded my monthly allotment, and I had to go and sign up for another ISP and 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 split off some of this stuff because uh, uh, Vimeo wanted an outrageous amount of money to increase my bandwidth to oh uh, compensate for the the extra viewers. And the 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 only thing I and I think it's great that people are are liking the show and watching it, but it's not making me any more money. I'm not getting any more new advertisers. I'm getting I get I get a couple of people that support the show each month to join, um, but at the same time, a couple of people usually drop off, and not because they don't like the show. It's because because the economy is getting bad again and they they can't afford to support the show and pay their bills and i get that i yeah. get that well you know but, what but right now but right now it's paying for itself and as long as it's paying for itself uh, i'm happy so well you know what i'm going to do in sort of preparation for your return whenever that may be is i'll go on your site and pick somebody one or two listen to the interview and then maybe we can talk about them that way, I've okay. got some idea of what you've covered well, uh, with them, so I know. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, I'll have to listen to them again because I've done over six hundred shows, and like you know, Shelley Berman was on in two thousand nine, and Jonathan Winters was on in two thousand twelve. Winters told me a story I had never heard before, and I didn't. I I was actually, believe it or not, I was speechless. I'll I'll tell you this real quick in case you want him as a subject in a future show. So we're talking about. I, I had to go to Montecito to do his show because his health was failing. He was still sharp, but he was having trouble walking. It was just easier for him. I schlepped all my uh, computer equipment and, and mixer and everything up to his house, and we did the show in his den. And, of course, I prepared for the show and everything, and you know, his people were there making sure that I didn't do anything that I wasn't supposed to do and making sure that I, I let him do his shtick, which I did, and they, everybody was very pleased. But he was a toy collector. He had... Literally thousands of little figurine toys and and army tanks and you know stuff we GI Joes and stuff we used to play with as a kid. All the whole house was just filled with toys. And Janine was with me, and he gave Janine a couple of little toys. So and I knew none of this. So I don't know if we started the show with this or it just came up in conversation. Um, but I I said. Uh, first of all, I said, do I call you Mr. Winters or, you know, do I call you Jonathan? And he goes, you can call me your highness, you know, which I <laughs> thought was really funny. All right. He said that John is fine. Uh, so, so I called him John through the whole thing. And I said, John, you know, I'm fascinated by your collection. I said, this is like one big FAO Schwartz here. This is like the, the biggest toy store I ever seen. I said, do you, do you, uh, do you still collect toys? He said, well, every once in a while, he says, that's why I gave your, your lady a couple of them. They don't mean as much to me anymore, but he said, I'll, I'll tell you the story. And he was dead serious. He had a horrible childhood. His parents hated him. He kept an optimistic attitude toward them. He didn't hate them back, but they, they didn't like him. For whatever reason, maybe he was a mistake. I didn't delve into that. I didn't think it was my business. But he said he got drafted, and he went. You know, he collected toys back then. Had had hundreds and hundreds of toys. Maybe not as many as he had when I saw him, but he had them. So he went off to war for two years. Right, the war is over. He comes back in 1945, and you know he's 20, 21 years old, but you know still a kid at heart. He comes back. And the parents are, first of all, uh, they don't give him a great welcome when he comes. Oh, you're home. Okay, fine. You know, go to your room, whatever. He goes to his room and the toys are all gone. Every single thing that he collected as a kid was gone. Oh. He comes back downstairs and he's practically in tears. He's 20 years old. And he says to his father, 
what, what happened to all my toys? He said, well, we got rid of them. He said, why did you do that? And his father said, well, we didn't think you were going to live. Ooh. Now, he, t- he tells that on my show, and, and I didn't know what to say. There's it's a, it's a little uncomfortable silence. And then he said, now you know why I have so many toys. Wow. And, and I said, oh, my God. And he goes, I could tell. And, and then he proceeded to tell me some other stories about his father treating him badly and everything. He turned, he turned some of them into bits. So they, they were funny, but they were also heartbreaking at the same time. I mean, here's, here's a guy who clearly was a, a comic genius, but had his share of demons, you know, uh, was in a, you know, committed himself to a mental hospital. And, and when you listen to parts of the interview that I did with him, and I didn't solicit any of this. He brought it up because he felt comfortable enough with me, you know, because I let him do what he wants. He, you, you realize why he's the way he, he was. Yeah. That, that, you know, the bits and playing the characters, and everything was a release for him so that he could get attention and be loved. I mean, that's what I, I didn't say that on the show, but that's what if you listen to that, you'll come. I haven't heard that show in over 10 years, but but coming away from that, I mean, he was a sweet, lovely man. But boy, did he have a closet full of demons. And I'd never heard him talk about this on any other talk show. And so I felt honored that he was comfortable enough with me to uh, uh, to talk about it. I, I, we, I went back up there uh, a month later. I called him. And I said, you know, I'd like to see you again. You gave me such a great show. Can I take you to lunch at your favorite restaurant up there? He goes, well, you can take me to lunch, but you're not going to pay for it. And uh, I, I drove up there, and I picked him up, and we went to his Mexican restaurant down by the beach there that he loved. And, he, of course, he entertained everybody there, you know, the waitresses, the cook, the chef came out, the other <laughs> patrons. I mean, it's Jonathan Winters. I sat there, and it was it was one of the greatest afternoons of my life, just letting him you know, be him. And, and apparently when he lived in the valley, when he lived in Toluca Lake, he would do that all the time. He'd sit out on his front porch and anybody walking by on the sidewalk, he'd, he'd entertain. This was a man that just wanted attention and just wanted to be loved. And it was kind of sad. And he was a sweet, sweet man. We talked about it's a mad, 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 mad world. We talked about his his variety show on CBS, and they can't they canceled it because he he didn't want any writers. He just wanted to be do do his shtick, and the network wouldn't let him do that. No, well, you got to have writers, bad. and you got and you got to do sketches. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Well, listen, so, I'm uh, going to research on your website, and we'll find some people to do for next time. Uh, do you want to give out your website real quick for your show? Yeah, it's uh, stewshow.com, as simple as that. And if you have a Roku device, just uh, go to the streaming channels area on Roku and search Stew Show. The channel will come up. Just install it, put it on your menu, and uh, you're right there. All right, great. Always a pleasure, Stu. Thank you so much, and to be continued. All right. Thank you, Douglas. Always a pleasure for me to be with you, too.